back. So um, maybe we can skip the introduction and we shall move again, move ahead uh, with the lecture. What do you say, ma'am? Vinita, ma'am? Yes, I, I think that, that's a good uh, idea. Okay. Uh, so, um, my dear friends, colleagues, uh, uh, teachers, uh, students, uh, whoever the esteemed audience present here, uh, a very warm good afternoon uh, to each one of you. I'm not sure whether it is warm everywhere because we hear news of floods in many parts of North India and the Northeast. Uh, let's hope that they also have uh, a heart and, and, and something that will keep them warm and sheltered. So uh, my dear friends, today that this lecture, um, she would have introduced, but I would do the introduction. So this lecture is titled Post-Humanism and Moral Imagination, Literature as Panacea. This is the title of this uh, lecture, Post-Humanism and Moral Imagination, Literature as panacea. I'm sure we are familiar with all the terms that I have mentioned in this title. And of course, I would uh, try to reframe these words, uh, these terms within the context of this FDP, which is titled Shifting Paradigms in English Literature and English Language Teaching. Now, what interests me most in this title of our FDP is the word shifting. Our FDP is titled Shifting Paradigms in English Literature and English Language Teaching. Shifting Paradigms. Shifting. Of all the synonyms and definitions of the word shifting, I would be focusing on the meaning unstable as in shifting stance, shifting sense, something that is unfirm, unsteady, loose. What is unsteady? What is unfirm? What is loose um, among the paradigms that we are speaking about? Are we on unstable ground? FDP on shifting paradigms in English literature and ELT. What is, what is shifting? What is unstable? My dear friends, I would be happy if I can impress upon you, my dear listeners, some straight thoughts on the need for moral imagination among the academic community to help our species survive in these troubled times. We have heard Matthew Arnold speaking about epochs. He has spoken, up, spoken, he has told us about creative and critical epochs. Are we in a creative epoch or a critical epoch right now? What history has taught us and told us is that epochs of intense creativity have followed waves of global devastation and destruction. Epochs of creativity have come after global crises. If that is the case, you know, uh, in, uh, in the logical corollary would be to assume that we are going through a critical epoch. I would call this a critical epoch. The ideas and ideals of this world, this critical epoch, the ideas, our ideas, our ideals should transmute into raw materials for creativity. Evidently, our belief systems, our pride as a species, as the crown of creation has been violently shaken up by a small virus first, then by a big war, Russia, Ukraine, then by the flash floods in Assam, now in Gujarat, and violent economic unrest in our neighboring country. But we hear what is happening in Sri Lanka. 
But I would say it was after Corona came that we started hearing the word sifting all too often. Until Corona came, our civilization was firmly rooted in capitalism with its ideals of globalization, liberalization and privatization. But now Corona has come, violence has come, war has come, floods have come. Now we need a fresh anchor, a new belief system, a savior. No, I'm not preaching. I will not do a Matthew Arnold. I just want to say it is shifting. Because it is shifting, we might need a fresh anchor. We are awaiting a second coming. And I wish that this will be a rebirth of poetry, a rebirth of literature, a rebirth of creativity in the human hearts, at least in the hearts of the academia, because the Aam Atmi has poetry in its hearts. It is, it is from the hearts of the academia that poetry and literature has been driven out. I hope literature will be that, that desperate panacea we are waiting for. There is no question about the power of the written word, the power of literature. It is enormous. I don't want to go into the utilitarian purposes of writing. As a speaker, as a creative writer, my responsibility is to knock my reader down, to keep my listener spellbound, to mesmerize my listener when I say what I say passionately, what I want to say passionately. Like the wedding, like the ancient mariner holding the wedding guest spellbound with his glittering eye, you see, I also would love to use my words to hold my audience dancing to my tunes. No, this is not a self praise and I'm not saying that I am a great rhetorician. That is not the idea. The idea is the power of literature. Literature is persuasion. It is a call to intimate companionship. The Sanskrit word for literature, you would know, as Sahitya, which has its root in Sahit, S-A-H-I-T, we can transliterate into English. Sahit, 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 Sukhrud, Sahit, companionship. Companionship between who? Between the reader and the writer, between the speaker and the listener, Sahit. This companionship, this mesmerizing effect, this captivating effect, is what we expect our literature to have. Literature has it, but we have we may have to wield it. Now, we I was speaking about the wedding guest in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. There is a beautiful stanza. Since then, and an at an uncertain hour that agony returns. And till my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. At an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Is it that uncertain hour? Is this 21st century Corona post COVID, COVID period, that uncertain hour when that agony is returning to our bosoms. And do we have a ghastly tale to tell? Because it burns our hearts. You know, instead of the crows, the albatross around my neck was hung, says the ancient mariner. Instead of the crows, the albatross. What is the albatross around our neck, my dear friend? Because we need a we need an albatross around our necks so that we will tell the tale, that so that that agony returns. 
What is that albatross about our neck? In terms of philosophy, in terms of literary theory, I would say that the albatross about the neck of the 21st century man is neatly summarized in the idea of post-humanism. Post-humanism is one of the shifts, shifting paradigms in literature and ELT, FDP. One of the shifts is post-humanism. As its name suggests, it, 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 it is about a shift from humanism to post-humanism. And a defining characteristic of post-humanism would be its rejection of traditional Western humanism. What is this thing with traditional Western humanism? It placed man rather than God at the, at the center of all enterprises whether it be philosophical, whether it be creative, whether it be literary, man was at the center of all enterprises. Man as the crown of creation. Everything else was believed to be, to have been made for man, for his consumption, for his luxury, for his enjoyment. Basically, a man-centered view of the universe was humanism. Postmodernism, on the other hand, designates a new way of understanding the human subject in relationship to the natural world in general. It seeks to undermine, subvert the boundaries that traditionally existed, or it may not have existed, we created those boundaries, right? The traditional boundaries between the human, the animal, and the technological. I am sure we, we know this post-human situation. When I am sitting here using technology, uh, talking to you, I am a human being. I am clutching a mouse, which is a synonym for a rat or, you know, an animal. And then we have this technology that is taking me to you, taking you to me, the post-human. The human is, but the thing with post-humanism is it kind of reduces the role of the human being. It seeks to undermine those traditional boundaries. So the animal is as important as a human being. The technological is as important as a human being. The virus is probably more important than a human being we have learned. So these things are there and the human is but one life form among many. And it is a troubled time, no doubt about it, because not just about the violence or the corona or the floods, it is also a world of half-truths and misrepresentations. The media, the visual media, the print media, the media tells a sad tale of a failed media. How media should not be is what we see in today's media. And what is the solution? I don't know. People like Hillis Miller would advocate liberal education as a, as a solution to, to the problems that have afflicted our society, our media. And what is liberal education? It provides a greater opportunity for the members of a society to, be, to become literate, compassionate. And, and, and remember these words, compassionate and thoughtful citizens of the world. So liberal education, dear friends, the thing that we are doing, the thing that we are expected to do as teachers of languages and literature is to impart liberal education. Liberal education believes that any human crisis can be resolved by man himself without seeking assistance from divine supernatural forces. And I, I don't go into the details of liberal education, but I, I, I just want to tell you what it will be without liberal education. You know, without liberal education to teach us how his story, how the history has succeeded or failed 
in directing the fruits of technology and science to our tribe of humans, Homo sapiens. Without liberal education to teach us how to frame our discussions, without liberal education to teach us how to properly debate the uses and the costs of technology, without liberal education to teach us how to safely debate how to create a more egalitarian, just society with our fellow human beings. Without liberal education, what would eventually happen? Eventually, it would default to the ownership of and misuse by the most influential, the most powerful, and the most feared among us. Exactly what happened some 60, 70 years ago when Hitler and Mussolini were doing certain things. And this is what we might expect in the near future. And in this changing and changed academic scenario, the teachers, we, the teachers, are being called upon to make an ethical representation of events. Our children don't know our students may not know that media cannot always be trusted. What they hear and see needn't always be the truth. So who should make the ethical representation of events? It is up to us. The onerous task of making an ethical representation of events or the task of telling our students that they should be wary of what they are bombarded with is the duty of the teacher. Teaching and learning humanities help us to be citizens of the world. Ultimately, it helps us make statements. What statements? Not a political statement, not a correct statement, not a legal statement, but a human statement. Liberal education helps us to make human statements. And my dear friends, we do not know whether all these things that we have been seeing in the past two and a half years are just a trailer of what is to come. We believe that it's over. But what if it is the trailer, just the trailer? We might live in a totally different, different world. So it is the duty of our educational system and our teachers to prepare our students for the changed world order. For as Khalil Gibran would say, alone and without the nest shall the eagle fly across the sun. Our students are eagles, friends. They have to fly across the sun, but they will be alone. We have to prepare them for the changed world order. Now, my lecture is about literature as panacea. I'm sure you're familiar with the word panacea, solution for all, you know, uh, all, uh, all curing, solution for all. How can literature be the panacea? And then what, what exactly is this panacea? L let's take, you know, let's briefly take a synoptic look at the word panacea. If there are doctors among us, not doctors of philosophy, because there are many, I mean doctors of medicine. If there are doctors among us, they would know panacea. Why? Not because they offer panacea to people, but because when they said the Hippocratic Oath, they mentioned panacea. If you remember the Hippocratic Oath, which we studied in class 9, class 10, it says, I swear, calling upon Apollo, the physician, and Aesculapius, Hygia, and Panacea, and all the gods and goddesses as witnesses, that I will fulfill this oath and this contract according to my ability and judgment. This is how they took the Hippocratic oath. Now remember, Hippocrates is useful for us. Panacea is named after the Greek goddess of universal remedy, Panacea herself. 
she is supposed to be any remedy that is claimed to cure all diseases and prolong life indefinitely it's also a literary term panacea that represents any solution to solve all problems related to a particular issue now my dear friends i would want you all to involve briefly in this discussion and tell me what do you think would be an ideal antonym for the word panacea for a moment let us think about the antonyms of panacea what could be the opposite of a solution or remedy for all difficulties and diseases what could be the opposite i would like to hear from you or if your voices are not en enabled at least you can uh, put it in the chat box so that we all can see what could be the opposite antonym of the word panacea has anybody you know uh, how can you know uh, i know that there may not be a very obvious term but think about it what is panacea all curing a, a solution for all problems so what could be the opposite of it it could be something related to say difficulty hindrance maybe blockage obstruction a problem damage come on come on even the pandemic 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 yeah this yes Opposite to panacea, right? <laughs> it is opposite to panacea, definitely. Uh, dilemma can be an opposite. Dilemma, quandary. You, we can look at the synonyms of dilemma, and we will get a few terms. Quandary, quagmire, complication, um, crisis, emergency. Hey, where are the teachers of the great Amity University? Not a single you antonym. You're getting answers. You're getting answers in chat box. Trauma. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing. Oh, okay. my goodness. Okay, 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 okay. Ah, That's obstruction, trauma. Oh. Yeah. Hindrance, um, pain, obstruction. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. They are all here. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obstruction. Yes, exactly. Uh, these are some of the words we can think. Exigency. Emergency. Imbroglio. Quack man. What else? <sighs> the, the more literary, you know, I wish there was a Shashi Tharoor here. He would have offered us some, you know, <laughs> heart nuts to crack. A conundrum. Mm, conundrum is a good one, yeah. Mm, mess. Obstacle. Maybe. Enigma. Enigma. Mm. Adversity, somebody has written Ridhima. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now look at the title of the FDP and can you find a word that is the opposite of panacea? Come on. Look at the title of our FDP. Shifting paradigms in literature and language teaching. Can you find a word that is the antonym of panacea? My dear friends, think about it. Isn't shifting an antonym of panacea? Shifting is about change. Shifting is about being unstable. Shifting is about being not there. Shifting, exigency. When I said exigency, you agreed. Now, exigency is a synonym for the word shifting. 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 Shifting is an antonym. Now, I am not saying this FDP is against panacea, or I am not saying that panacea is against this FDP, nothing at all. But, you know, I don't know whether people from literary theory would be here. Many, I, I guess many would be here. Can you guess a word in literary theory that would, you know, be an antonym for the word panacea? I'm not an expert, but I think the word aporia would be a good one. Aporia. An irresolvable internal contradiction, logical disjunction within a text, argument, or theory. It's an aporia. It, it, you don't, you know, it, it takes you nowhere, no solution. Aporia could be a term in literary theory. But who cares about literary theory these days? Now, 
I would say, let us come back to medicine because we were speaking about Hippocrates. And in medicine, probably the antonym is miasma. Miasma. Because interestingly, the miasma theory was advanced by the same Hippocrates, whose oath we just, uh, you know, we, we were just recalling. Hippocrates in the fourth century BC coined this idea of the miasmatic theory. And this idea was accepted from ancient times in Europe and China. Now, you know, since the 1800s, I would say 1850, after the 1850s, this theory, miasmatic theory by Hippocrates has been largely discredited, abandoned by scientists and physicians, replaced by the germ theory of disease. Now, the question is, what causes disease? And Hippocrates suggested rather wrongly that it is miasma that caused all diseases. Now, since the 1800s, people have found out that it is not miasma, but germs, specific germs that are the causes of many diseases. Now, I'm sure you are in very familiar with miasma. So let us look at the word miasma as well, because that will tell us a little bit about what is ailing our society. In Greek mythology, a miasma, M-I-A-S-M-A, a miasma is a contagious power that has an independent life of its own. Until purged by the sacrificial deaths of the perpetrator of the crime, society would be, you know, uh, chronically infected by catastrophe. The best example would be Oedipus Rex. We have, we have read the story of Oedipus and he took, uh, you know, Creon. He asked Creon to go to the Delphic Oracle to check what was wrong with his thieves because it was barren. The country was barren. The people were barren. The women were barren. Their fields were barren. Their bellies were barren. Everything was barren. So what caused this barrenness? And the answer was there is pollution. Pollution. There is pollution in the country of Thebes. And only when the object, the cause for the pollution is removed, there will be a solution. Now, pollution is Hippocrates' antonym for panacea. Miasma. Miasma is the Greek word for pollution or corruption. And we remember, uh, you know, until Oedipus was driven out by his own words, let to say, driven out of Thebes, Thebes wasn't cured of the famines, wasn't cured of the pollution that inf infected uh, the country. So miasma is a contagious power that has an independent life of its own, and it can only be purged by the sacrificial deaths of the wrongdoer. This is the idea. So thieves, pollution, what was the pollution? He committed a regicide, he committed patricide, right? he, he killed his own father. Now, the miasma theory is an uh, obsolete theory. We no longer give any importance to the miasmatic theory, but it held that diseases such as cholera or black death, if uh, had it been uh, present now, they would have spoken about corona also in the same vein. So diseases such as, such as cholera or black death were all caused by a miasma, bad air, also known as night air. Now, the theory held that the epidemics, all of the epidemics, Vinayamem was telling us that this pandemic is an antonym for a panacea. Now, all the pandemics, they said, were caused by miasma emanating from rotting organic matter. Rotting organic matter. Now, literature people would tell me that there is another word for rotting organic matter. When it is the inside of the human conscience that is rotting, we call it decadence. Decadence. 
and some people of the 1800s early 1900s believed that it was uh, it was a phrase and they took the name for themselves uh, they took it as a label and they called themselves the decadent generation ah we are the decadents so uh, you know this is decadence here comes the relevance of decadence rotting organic matter now what is decadence what i'm coming to i, I hope you are getting my point what characterizes our society is a version of decadence 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 is a state of deterioration or decay especially due to being excessively morally corrupt or self indulgent moral wrong doing can lead to decadence moral loneliness is decadence you can even pronounce it as decay dense decay dense dense decay isn't it decadence decadence is not simply a, a synonym for excess or extravagance it also suggests that one's morals have gone down and the solution for decadence i would argue is moral imagination and that is the topic for today's lecture moral imagination the solution for the decadence that is blighting our lives is moral imagination now the phrase moral imagination occurs in edmund burke's famous work on the french revolution it's titled something like uh, you know uh, reflections on the revolution in france published sometime in the early 1790s so in this particular book burke edmund burke describes describes the destruction of civilizing manners because of revolution he speaks about the destruction of values thanks to the revolutionaries now we are not against the revolutionaries but there is something about the revolutionaries that edmund burke criticizes and i will just quote it for you so that you can see whether these terms would suit our times so this is how edmund burke characterizes decadence during his times all the decent drapery of life is rudely torn off all the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation are exploded as a ridiculous absurd and antiquated fashion on this scheme of things in decadence a king is but a man a queen is but a woman a woman is but a but an animal and an animal not of the highest order now you can see the connection between decadence and post humanism the boundaries getting blurred between the human the animal and the non animal by this moral imagination edmund burke signifies that power of ethical perception which strides beyond the barriers of private experience and momentary events you know how to do it we called it you know it was longinus who famously called it the sublime now the dictionary would say the higher form of this power of moral imagination is exercised in poetry and in art now would you believe that the encyclopedia and the dictionary ratify the idea that the moral imagination is best exemplified in poetry and in art what we are doing the moral imagination was the gift and the obsession of people of of the of the ancients people like plato virgil dante drawn from centuries of home human consciousness the concepts connected with moral imagination are ex 
expressed are articulated from time to time across the ages and it is the duty of the men of letters whose work seem more like most likely to endure the test of time to speak about moral imagination look at the 20th century the the, the, the you know tossed by the winds of modernism people like t s eliot robert frost faulkner wo william butler yeats all these people spoke about moral imagination albeit in different terms yesterday we celebrated the 50 52nd 52nd anniversary of harper lee's uh, to kill a mockingbird yesterday was the 52nd anniversary of the publication of to kill an to kill a mockingbird 11th july 1960 that is the date of publication so look at to kill a mockingbird and you will agree that there is a moral imagination exemplified and illustrated in a work like to kill a mockingbird it is the moral imagination which informs us concerning the dignity of human nature which instructs us that we are more than naked apes now this is a contentious statement i am sure people because people like you all know noah harari are saying that we are nothing much more than naked apes but if there is something that separates us we thought that it was our power of choice then we realized that that is not the case then we thought that it is our this thing reason then these days people say it is only in imagination that we are slightly better than or slightly different from i don't use the word better than i would not embrace the margins no uh, so slightly different from the naked apes as edmund burke suggested in the 1790s letters and learning are hollow if deprived of moral imagination i haven't yet explained moral imagination i am sure but that 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 phrase itself is sufficient to explain itself but of course we will come to that later but before going into the details of moral imagination let us look at the word imagination itself burke implies that there are there existed other forms of imagination than the moral imagination Burke died in 1797 you will do well to recall that the preface to lyrical ballads was published in 1798 the manifesto of the romantic movement so he might not have had the opportunity to listen to what the romantics had had to say about imagination because the romantics were the people who spoke extravagantly about imagination we know what we know we have the in the benefit of hindsight and so we know what imagination meant to the romantics we have taught we have studied coleridge's famous postulation on fancy and imagination those tough lines that were extremely difficult to explain let alone understand imagination was elevated to a position as the supreme faculty of the human mind this contrasted distinctly with the arguments for the supremacy of reason reason versus imagination that was the trend the romantics tended to define and to present imagination as our ultimate shaping or creative power they remember those words uh, sm plastic that coleridge uses as a plastic shaping creative power the approximate human equivalent of the creative powers of nature or even of dt creativity is best exemplified in imagination according to the romantics no wonder keats you know the last born and the first to die no wonder he said my imagination is a monastery and i am its monk he also said i am certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections 
and the truth of imagination. Keats also said, what the imagination ceases as beauty must be truth. So that was the romantic ideal, romantic conception of the sublime idea of imagination. Of course, Edmund Burke was well aware of the idea of imagination according to Ram Rackus Rousseau. Rousseau had his own postulations on imagination and Burke had access to that in his lifetime. And Irving Babbitt calls the version of imagination postulated by uh, Rousseau as the idyllic imagination, not our dosha idli, sambar idli, but the idyllic, I-D-Y-L-L-I-C, idyllic imagination. That is the imagination which rejects old dogmas, which rejects old manners and rejoices in the notion of emancipation from duty and convention, liberty, liberty. We saw this idyllic imagination in the 1960s and 1970s in, you know, uh, in the hippie culture, for example, uh, the things that were happening in the United States of America. If you take an instance, young people in America during the 1960s and the 70s, you know, they were living a, a life of idyllic imagination. But I'm not sure whether they read Rousseau, but they lived Rousseau's idea of imagination. The idyllic imagination, the problem with the idyllic imagination, as we saw with those cultures, the 1960s and 70s cultures, what we saw was the idyllic imagination ordinarily terminates in dissolution and boredom, the postmodern condition. Or, or, you know, if you go back to the existential condition, the dissolution and boredom. And when that occurs, when dissolution meant boredom, ennui, E N N U I. On we characterizes our existence too often a third form of imagination manifests itself so i had spoken about burke's idea of moral imagination i had spoken about keats's and you know the romantics idea of pure imagination i have also spoken about Ra rousseau's idea of idyllic imagination but when none of these happens when the idyllic imagination leads to disillusionment and boredom, then a third or fourth form of imagination gains ascendancy. What is it? You know, it is, it is there in T.S. Eliot. In his lectures entitled After Strange Gods, After Strange Gods, not something that came after Strange Gods, but going after strange gods probably after strange gods published 1934 in after strange gods t.s Eliot touches upon the diabolic imagination diabolic imagination probably the best opposite antonym that you would get for moral imagination the diabolic imagination that kind of imagination which delights in the perverse and subhuman, perverse and subhuman imagination, the diabolic imagination. Iliad finds the fruitful operations of the evil spirit in the writings of Thomas Hardy and D. H. Lawrence. We need not agree. Anyone interested in the moral imagination and in the anti-moral imagination, I would recommend Please read After Strange Gods by T.S. Eliot. It is at least fulfilling. And we, you know, knowingly or unknowingly, we are also in, in the devil's side, right? We, we also love uh, Satan and the devil. So the diabolic imagination is far more interesting than moral imagination. I vouch. So After Strange Gods by T.S. Eliot, the number of people, he says, the number of people in position of any criteria for discriminating between good and evil is very small people who can distinguish between good and bad is very small says T.S. Eliot the number of the half alive hungry 
for any form of spiritual experience or for what offers itself as spiritual experience, high or low, good or bad, is considerable. Yes, some people are interested in spiritual things, not because they are spiritual, but because they want to know what it is all about and whether we can make some money out of the spiritual. And Eliot makes a confession. He says, my own generation has not served them well, very well. Never has the printing press been so busy and never have such varieties of buncom and false doctrine come from it. Woe, woe it is, like, like a prophet, like a, you know, like a powerful, you know, um, T.S. Eliot believed that he was, uh, what was the name of that book? Sacred Wood. So uh, in, in the Sacred Wood, he, he commissions himself as the high priest of poetry, as the greatest, uh, cont you know, the king of the wrecks, right? That, that is how uh, he characterizes himself. And the Rex, the king of criticism, T.S. Eliot, uh, you know, he makes this proclamation. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. This is the diabolic imagination. The, 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 the false prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing according to T.S. Eliot. This diabolic imagination dominates most of popular literature today. I'm sorry to all the supporters of popular literature. I didn't say anything, but I am just saying some people said somewhere that diabolic imagination, perverted imagination dominates most of popular fiction, popular literature today and on television and in the theaters too. The diabolic imagination struts and postures. It flaunts itself. You know, since T.S. Eliot spoke at the University of Virginia in 1933 about this diabolic imagination, we have come a great way farther down the road. And literature, with, 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 with one heart on my own, with one hand on my own heart, I am saying literature has sunk into the perverse so much so that modern civilization is falling into its own ruin the blood dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned it's it's okay to say that we defend literature it is not the problem with literature it is the problem with people who use literature literature is very good as always we can say all these things but what is literature doing today? Is it able to do anything? Is anybody reading any literature today? If I publish a poetry collection, I get zero downloads. If, even if it is for free, I get zero downloads. You will say that, Manu, sir, it is because your poetry is so terrible that nobody downloads. But you publish it and I, I can assure you that you will also get zero downloads. Nobody reads poetry. What has happened? I am not a preacher, but there is something terribly wrong with what is happening with literature. And you and me, the so-called teachers of literature, have a big blame in it. No question about it. If we are not taking the blame and correcting it, who will? Should we expect the Amatmi to do it? Should we expect, um, you know, Ravinder Singh and uh, Durjoy Datta to do it? We blame them. We, we say that they are, uh, you know, um, they, 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 they are making our reading audience petty. They are giving false literature. Uh, and we have this hypocrisy to drive out Mahashweta Devi and put uh, these people into our Delhi University curriculum. We do that as well. Anyway, anyway, the blood dimmed tide is used, loosed. Is there a true purpose to literature, my dear friends? Is there a true purpose to humane letters? We have heard about purposes. We have heard about Dulce, it's utilate, to delight and to instruct. We know all these things, but as C.M. George points out in his book titled Decadence, a philosophical inquiry, 
what we call decadence amounts to the loss of an end loss of a purpose loss of an object and when literature has lost sight of its real object or purpose literature is decadent when literature loses sight of its purpose our literature has lost sight of its purpose so our literature may have gone decadent think think and what then is that end object or purpose of human letters that we can attribute to literature today why i would say it is the articulation of the moral imagination it's my take you all of us all of us here can have their own different takes on how literature should express itself it's just my personal take that literature the proper end of literature today at least should be the expression the articulation of the moral imagination or to put it in a more familiar face phrase i would say the end of books is ethical now you will say i am preaching no no you are preaching to teach us what it means to be genuinely human great literature is meant to teach us what it is to be fully human holding a mirror up to nature what nature do you think that uh, when he said holding a mirror literature is about holding a mirror up to nature did he say about the outside nature the mountains the rivers the valleys no he spoke about the inside nature holding a mirror up to the inside nature the nature within me which is it the human nature the human nature irving babbitt has written a small book students love this book because it is ultimately small very small book titled literature and the american Col college this is the title 1908 it's a very small book and you can uh, prescribe it for any uh, student because they would love it they will not find a smaller uh, book irving babbitt's literature and Amer um, american college but this book is lovely you know here he speaks about humanism as an ethical discipline intended to develop the truly human person the qualities of manliness please don't confuse it with womanliness manliness you know i'm not into that it simply means humanliness uh, the qualities of manliness through the study of great books and what it is opposed to what he is juxtaposing this humanism with is the literature of nihilism the literature of pornography the literature of sensationalism as albert salmon suggests in his book the tyranny of progress 1955 uh, absolutely beautiful book the tyranny of progress by uh, Sal Sal salomon uh, albert salomon he says this this is a recent development this kind of decadence is a recent development arising in the 18th century now recent doesn't mean in, in 1954, he, he, mean, he sees the larger picture and he says arising in the 18th century, though reaching its height in our time, with the decay of the religious views of life and, you know, I, I don't know uh, whether we should bring religion into it, but he says most prominently with the decline of what has been called the great tradition of philosophy. Now, I do not mean that the great writer insistently should write homilies. He should preach on the pulpit. No. With Ben Johnson, he must scourge the naked follies of the time. But he should not murmur like Charles Kingsley. Be good. You know, he is telling his daughter, be good, sweet maid, and let who will be clever. It's, it's, it's a very sad state when Charles Kingley tells his daughter, this is the only thing I have got to tell you. And he says, be good until you find somebody clever. You know, it, it's painful. It's painful. It's painful because clever is something that is juxtaposed as the antagonist of being good. Rather, the man of letters teaches the norms of our existence through allegory, through analogy, holding a mirror up to nature. The writer may, 
like william faulkner uh, earlier we saw how william faulkner was criticized by t s eliot as possessing the diabolic imagination i wouldn't subscribe to that the writer may like william faulkner write much more of what is evil than of what is good but william faulkner did something else as well which t s eliot missed he exhibited the depravity of human nature he established in his readers mind the awareness that there exists enduring standards from which we have fallen away and that fallen human and that fallen nature is is an ugly sight faulkner has said this too which t.s eliot sorely missed the better the artist one more, you know we can say the better the artist the more subtle will be the preacher so if i sound like a preacher i have failed as a rhetorician if i sound like a rhetorician i have succeeded as an artist because the preacher is there who is silently telling you the things without uh, you know manifesting itself or himself imaginative persuasion not blunt exhortation commonly is the method of the genius right imaginative persuasion without blunt exhortation that is what that not not exhortation uh, exhortation not blunt exhortation that is what we need and if a public will have the moral imagination then it will first fall you know let us see what will happen if a public does not have a moral imagination if it doesn't have a moral imagination first it will fall into it it will have probably hopefully the pure imagination of the romantics and then it will fall slightly into the idyllic imagination that looks at the freedom that looks at the liberty and then if that also doesn't provide it provide the masses the satiety that it craves for then it might descend into the diabolic imagination this last one becoming a state of narcosis figuratively and literally my dear friends do we react this is the question the ultimate question is do we react to what we see around us yesterday i i, I was listening to the news and they said india is closing its borders so that the sri lankans who are escaping from sri lanka will not enter our shores now are the sri lankans rats in our homes that we are trying to catch them and block them my dear friends are in they human beings yes it is all fine there are boundaries there is the national thing everything but where is the human thing what can the poor sri lankan do why didn't i cry when floods ravished the homes and farms of the assamis it is in the northeast it is in the northeast somewhere far not my problem not my problem is it my way of looking at things do i react do i at least respond empathetically do i do that can i do that a human body that cannot react is a corpse now think about it a human body that cannot react is a corpse am i a corpse are you a corpse and a body of letters you and me we who claim that we are the, the you know we are the watchword we are the harbingers of civilization we are the holders the you know the, the great successors of t s eliot and william wordsworth are we able to react against certain things are we reacting a body of letters that cannot react against narcotic illusions i would say it must better be buried because you are corpse i am corpse if i am not reacting i am a corpse and i should not be allowed to rot because it will cause further decadence 
it will cause fumes of miasma pollution so i must be buried you must be buried if you are not reacting if you are not responding this is what thomas lacker the american historian sexologist writer said when he defined moral imagination to be a citizen of the world we ought to have a moral imagination defining it thomas lacker said he stated that it is moral imagination i i i i would say that this is the most important statement i am making in this whole lecture moral imagination according to thomas lacker is something that allows us to regard the suffering of distant humans as making the same sort of claim on us as the suffering of proximate ones this is his definition moral imagination allows us to regard the suffering of distant humans as making the same sort of claim on us as the suffering of proximate ones yes when my near and dear suffers i will be feeling the pangs of you know but what when an american suffers what when a ukrainian suffers what when an assamese person suffers does it create that same pang in my inside the suffering of distant humans must make the same sort of claim on us as the suffering of our near and dear ones this is more moral imagination i'm sure you would say that this is some sort of empathy yes we are all familiar with empathy but are you familiar with the person who popularized the word empathy or i would say the person who coined the word empathy it's i think it it's a historical justice that the person who coined empathy is a woman a person the person who coined empathy is a woman violet page that's her name she lived in the last decades and early decades last decades of the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century somewhere in 1930 she passed away she was a victorian poet writer who published under the male pseudonym vernon lee violet page i'm sure even the pseudonym must might not be familiar to many of us she was known as one of the is known as one of the cleverest women in europe she coined the term empathy after noticing the physical absorption of her partner while viewing a painting she said her partner was in feeling within double quotes in feeling with the painting this is empathy to describe this embodied process of appreciating the arts lee translated the german term ein von blum into english and that is empathy for us lee's ideas resonate powerfully with the increasing interest today in how empathy is connected to creativity literature as panacea experiencing and enhancing creativity is one of the ways we can understand ourselves and others body mind the poetic 19th century term for now this is the most interesting thing the poetic 19th century term for empathy uh, is known as moral imagination poetically empathy is known as moral imagination and this is what thomas lacker uh, was saying and, and 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 to imagine when you imagine imagination to imagine is to form a mental image to think to believe to dream to picture it is both idea and ideal in a world of increasing global conflict imagination cannot be more overstated imagination is extremely important i would say you know i would use the phrase that william wordsworth uses 
intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood. To have those intimations of immortality, our world needs a moral imagination. Think about Shelley. Shelley spoke about moral imagination. The great instrument of moral good is the imagination, said Shelley, right? In his defense of poetry. In his defense of poetry, is it? Yeah, Shelley wrote defense of poetry. Um, somebody else wrote Apollo. So this is defense of poetry. So Shelley, in his defense of poetry, said the great instrument of moral good is imagination. He continues something like this. A man, to be greatly good, must imagine intensely and comprehensively. He must put himself in the place of many others. What is it? Empathy, right? The great instrument of moral good is imagination. He continues, the great secret of morals is love. Now, my dear friends, this is the 200th death anniversary year of Shelley. And we are hearing about Shelley everywhere. He passed away in 1822. 1822. Uh, he drowned. Right. Uh, so, Shelley is considered a rebel angel. He is considered a rebellious person. But my dear friends, he was considered uh, to be an atheist. There was a lot of, there, there were a lot of controversies surrounding Percy B. Shelley. But he said something very beautiful when he speaks about uh, moral imagination. A man, to be greatly good, but he must imagine intensely and comprehensively, the great secret of morals is love or a going out of our own nature being someone else and an identification of ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought action or person not our own identifying ourselves with beauty this is what shelley says to be greatly good we must imagine now how can we identify ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought, action, or person, not our own? I think Lord Krishna in his Bhagavad Gita gives a beautiful explanation. He tells Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, whatsoever, uh, I am the beauty of all beautiful things. Whatsoever is beautiful, issues forth from a fragment of my splendor. This is how I can roughly translate the Sanskrit version. I am the splendor of all splendid things. I am the beauty of all beautiful things. And whatsoever is beautiful, issues forth from a fragment of my splendor, Lord Krishna says. If that is the case, then don't we see why religions are also preaching? but never practicing empathy, rarely practicing empathy. Moral imagination is creative. It helps us to find better ways of being. It's a form of empathy that encourages us to be kinder and more loving to ourselves first and more loving to others as well. Our moral imagination can put us in touch with all that is truthful and beautiful in the world, in ourselves and in everyone else you know william butler reads in his preface to the poetry of william blake says something very interesting he says all worthy things all worthy beads all worthy thoughts are works of art or of imagination all worthy things all worthy deeds all worthy thoughts are works of art or of imagination William Butler gets and Percy Bishley again, he believed that we can believe, we can exercise our moral imagination in the same way as exercise strengthens a limb. Just as we do yoga, we can exercise our moral imagination. And how do we exercise our moral imagination? I will not go into the details. Uh, we can exercise our moral imagination through reading through rereading. We can exercise our moral imagination by watching movies because what happens in the world of art is empathy. We are detached from our ego. That is why I worry for the hero. I worry for the hero in the world of art that is called catharsis. 
dear friends these are not antique and ancient statements that don't have any importance now all these things have a little more importance let us give it a little more importance than we are giving right now and i would like to know should i continue speaking for another 15 minutes or should i stop it now because it is 1:15 uh, can the organizers tell me if i am allowed to speak i would like to speak Sir, about some you can speak yeah. for 5 10 more minutes uh, how more minutes how many minutes as to 10 minutes you can speak more okay 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 so roughly i would like to also look at i i guess i have explained sufficiently on moral imagination panacea uh, literature as panacea so what are the shifting paradigms that our lecture our workshop is looking at i will just say a few things one the digital divide is one of those shifting paradigms those who are tech savvy and those who access have access to technological gadgets will do well while the traditional the classroom oriented got to the background a clear shift, second one a clear shift in platform from offline yesterday uh, we had a lecture on the same topic uh, a platforms shifting from offline real time to online any time and less dependency on the teachers at the colleges i believe that the teachers are going to become more and more less redundant more and more redundant i think teachers are becoming redundant in the long run the end of living and the beginning of survival has already begun for us teachers the traditional teacher yes we have already made him or her a facilitator both literally and metaphorically but remember friends we are all our lectures are recorded now this on top of our meeting we can find a box recording all our lectures are getting recorded now do you really think that if we do not have a moral imagination our managements would really want us to be in the campus to teach the students they would want our lectures they would play these lectures in good amphitheaters and then they will tell us tata bye bye uh, all your service was very nice now you can sit at home and play with your kids because you had applied for leaves many times now you can have a permanent leave this can happen this can happen who knows uh, dr jayati fattachary and dr vinaya kumari who knows they all are going to stay at home soon after conducting all this fdps online who knows the traditional teacher the end i believe that it is also a beginning of the end of the institutionalization of teaching i will be a teacher i don't say all teachers will be jobless i will be a teacher but i will not be attached to any institution i will be a traveling teacher uh, if i am good at one particular topic i will teach that topic all over the country wherever i can reach there will only be experts and students will choose whom they want to teach them and students have all these lectures on youtube my dear friends all of us are on youtube and we think that's a good advertisement i tell you this is an advertisement but the one that they post after you are dead an advertisement funeral this time that is the advertisement that we have posted in all youtube channels called our lectures we are becoming redundant the institutionalization and centralization of education might be over forever and a paradigm shift in the attitude of the teacher and the student is happening it's a must it becomes a necessity for survival and quality adaptability will become the new watchwords because if you enhance quality it can never go out of demand the norms of publication participation all these norms are changing the workload of the teacher is increasing day by day i would say that now the teacher is only expected to preach this moral imagination because all that knowledge is out out there on the internet and good professors see i am speaking about moral imagination now if you can search on youtube you, you will find 10 different professors with greater eloquence speaking about moral imagination so what is the use of this me speaking about moral imagination i am redundant see these things are happening and, and bound to happen and i seriously believe that government is going to withdraw from education 
our government. Education will cease to be a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution. Think about it. The sprouting and flourishing of private institutions, private agencies, will quickly adapt to the market requirements. Vocational courses, STEM subjects, death of the human as the teacher, the birth of technology as the new teacher and the new savior. And probably we have to go interdisciplinary. The new national educational policy, you know, dwells at length on the need to be interdisciplinary. It expects all departments in our country to be interdisciplinary by 2040 AD. Are we ready? Go interdisciplinary. Now, how are we trying to be interdisciplinary? Probably by not probably by converting humanities into sciences. No, that is not the way. Interdisciplinarity should mean a broadening of horizons. It should never mean converting arts into science, as Northrop Five Fry would, would did with his archetypal criticism. They are turning literature scientific. It's a big mistake. And uh, with more technology and science infiltrating into the teaching learning process like never before, outcome based education will become the norm if it has it already. UGC is asking for outcomes. They want numbers when it comes to preparing the AQAR NARC reports. Now, Vinaya Kumari ma'am would agree. She has been hosting and conducting various events. She would agree that when everything is reduced to numbers, humanities would struggle to fit in because we are not about numbers. How are we going to show them uh, this bridge courses? And you know, we cannot do that in humanities. We find it extremely difficult. First thing, we didn't know the sciences. We didn't know mathematics. That's why we are English teachers. That is the truth that we don't tell others. So our, our numbers are very bad. Our arithmetic is very bad. Secondly, the things that we do in humanities cannot be converted into quantitative data most often. Humanities find it difficult to translate what it does into outcomes. Hence, what happens, not in your university, because I guess you have a lot of funding, but in many universities, humanities departments are struggling because of lack of funding, sidelining, marginalizing, underprivileging of humanities when compared to the STEM subjects. So I think moral imagination is the way forward. And my dear friends, why? Because the earth is sick. Man is sick. He needs medicine. The earth needs treatment, but he also needs care. Science cannot say you are sick and it is okay. We need arts and humanities to say that you are sick, but my dear friend, it is okay to be sick. A scientist looks at the RNA of the virus and its mutations. Arts and humanities is expected to look into the heart of the suffering person and share his pain, commiseration, empathy. There is no greater stimulator to empathy than the arts. It also tells us the, about what the right question to ask would be. What is the right thing to do? It helps us to make a critical inquiry into with this. I wind, I wind up my session. So critical inquiry, this is what moral imagination can help us do, to, to have a critical inquiry into certain things. One, the you know, immediate, think about it, the plight of fleeing Sri Lankans, news of Sri Lanka, India closing its sea routes to prevent Sri Lankans from entering India. Critical inquiry is required. Think about the plight of marginalized communities. Islamophobia. I don't think Roy spoke about it and she drew a lot of flack. Why aren't anybody speaking about anything? What has happened to our academic community? Nobody responds. I told you, then you are a corpse. If you don't react, if you don't respond, then better you be buried. Don't sit here smiling and telling things like me. Don't sit like this. The, you know, the plight of marginalized communities, not just Islamophobia, think about it, targeting the prophet, bulldozing homes. Who is, in, who is responding? I look around and I don't see anyone. 
And I also bury my head beneath and hope that somebody else would respond. Think about the plight of teachers who are forced to shift between online and offline work, whose salary is the half of what they used to receive, but the workload is just the double. Think of the plight of the student, the poor confused student who doesn't have access to a laptop or a 4G connection. Think of the plight of the Assamese and the Gujarati whose homes are swamped by flood. Think of the poor and the weak, the hopeless, the hapless, the jobless, and the fired. Like senior Hamlet's ghost, all these people are telling us, begging us, remember me, remember me. We have to remember them, my dear friends. We have to remember, but not just remember in our prayers. It's very easy. We will remember you in our prayers. You are there always in our prayers. God will grant you everything. You have to be the God to grant certain things as well, because God cannot give rice. God cannot, God doesn't. I don't see any gods coming down and giving rice and uh, essential commodities to people suffering in the floods in Assam. I was there recently. I didn't find any god coming on helicopter or uh, whatever wahana he had. No gods came there. Only a few human beings came with certain sacks of rice, 5 kg, 10 kg sacks of rice. Remember me. All those kids were telling us, remember me. We are here. We don't have food. You have to bring us food. We have to. It's not a it's not a criticism of the government machinery. It's not a criticism of anything. It's a criti self-criticism. It's a self-criticism. By being a part, thanks to Corona, I hope that some of us at least have learned a lot about being together, being one at heart through the panacea called art. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would look forward for questions. Anyone having any questions can please ask, sir. Questions or any observations, anything? Any comments, sir? Jibu, Jibu. Dr. Jibu. Uh, it was very lucidly explained, but, uh, you know, one thing that I notice is that, uh, you know, when you say, changing it is not actually changing it's just repeating all the patterns see. exactly yeah i couldn't hear what he said yeah even i couldn't hear. i, I see that. can you hear me now that's okay that's okay. <laughs> okay you know i found it very interesting this uh, moral imagination and the linkage with uh, empathy i think martha nussbaum has written a lot about this and it's interesting that our first session today was about storytelling and there is a very clear connect between the two because uh, the art of storytelling apparently really makes us more empathetic so i found that uh, you know good linkage between what uh, and moral imagination is such a terrific way of uh, defining empathy and dr vinita uh, do you know something and uh, dr jayati is the coordinator of today's sessions and she planned it so well that it happened. It, it, it might look like a coincidence, but we had planned it. Isn't it, Jayati, ma'am? <laughs> we had planned it so that the first session would be about storytelling and I would be speaking <laughs> about <laughs> That's a good one. Take the honor. Take the honor. <laughs> yes. So it was really wonderful listening to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And the, towards the end, he also said that uh, we should uh, pay heed i mean listen to the stories that they tell i am hungry please feed me you know Excellent. the stories yeah. that we often often miss because when we say storytelling it is uh, stories of maybe ramayana or mahabharas or you know different stories uh, those those cliche terms but there are stories that we tell through our lives there are different stories different types of stories that we tell you know and i, I think that is also one uh, you know linkage that i could see yeah, this idea of telling stories is very much important. And that's where I saw this idea of uh, senior Hamlet's remember me. And I think everywhere, when I go to a library, for example, when I go to a library, the books I read are telling me, remember me. Why should I remember them? Because if I don't remember them, 
I will not tell it about it to someone else. And if I don't tell, how will we know what is good? I remember long back in 2012 or 11, I, I, I you know, there was a movie uh, titled Shutter. That was the title of a Malayalam movie. And uh, I watched that movie around eight years later. I watched that movie and I absolutely enjoyed the movie so much so that I wanted to call its director, Mr. Joy Matthew, and to speak to him. So I called him and fortunately the call got connected and I called him and I told him that, sir, this was an amazing movie. I, 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 I am really fascinated by the way in which you have all those things I said. And he said, shut up, you bastard. This is what he said, shut up, you bastard. And I was thinking normally people would say, oh, thank you so much, Manu. Thank you so much. We are really happy that you watched the movie. Watch it again. This is what people will say. But this man said, shut up, you bastard. And he said, you don't have good friends. I did it. And, and he disconnected the call. I it was like a slap on my cheeks. So I was wondering why he said that. Shut up, you bastard. You don't have good friends. I thought about it and then I understood what he meant. If I had good friends, they would have watched this movie in 2012 itself when the movie was released in the theater and they would have told me and I would have watched this movie in 2012 itself. And had I done that, this movie wouldn't have been a flop in theaters. Now, it's not about the money. I think it's about telling stories about stories. We have to tell it is about a meta kind of storytelling, telling stories about stories so that I will others will know. Now, I went to Assam and I'm telling the stories of suffering people in Assam. Now, this story I am relaying to you, the stories they told, I'm relaying it to you. And this might spark something within you to give some aid. You know, it, it's not just about financial aid, it, even, even a, a, a thought of oh God. You know, that, that creates a kind of positive energy that gives them the strength to, 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 to survive, to hold on for one second longer, hoping that help would come to them. So I think this storytelling is ultimately important. And it's, 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 it also has, uh, what can I say, uh, a healing anodyne power, storytelling. You know, we speak about uh, salvation through narrativization, salvation, you attain in counseling, salvation, it, it all takes us to a healing cathartic process, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for uh, bringing that up. That was a nice observation. Thank you. So any more questions from anyone? If not, then we will proceed for the next session. But as of now, there will be a lunch break. And uh, Professor Yusuf Omar sir is already there, but we will start again uh, at two. Thank you so much, Manu Angatu sir. So it was really enriching and uh, a lot of introspective thinking involved, whatever you talk to us. And we, of course, look forward to listen to you again for uh, guest lectures and all for our students and us as well. It was so nice listening to you, sir. Thank you so much. From Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to express my thanks to Amity. I have been with Amity that, uh, you know, for the past couple of months, uh, through the Amity International Literature Festival uh, with Vinaya Ma'am. So that I, I didn't feel it necessary to thank each one or I, to say things like I'm really honored and privileged to be here because I feel at home at Amity and That's thanks. So nice. Uh, <laughs> so nice. That's really very nice of you. I remember I listened to your uh, speech, your session in the International Literature Festival also where you dwelt at length on Amity and the word. And I was so very impressed that I had a quick discussion with Vinaya. So thanks once again. Jayati has already expressed thanks on our collective behalfs. And we definitely look forward to a very fruitful and rewarding experience with you in the future as well.